and then uh, and then I'll move him because he will inevitably like want something and bark at me. But oh, okay. I just figure. So it's funny the it, just being at Philly, how many people were like, "Oh, I love the YouTube video with like the banter before and after the." <laughs> it's okay. really fun. I mean, just just truly like how many people come up and like talk about the show, right? And the one it's it's just awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome. But uh, I want one of those hats. Where'd you get that so hat? Thank, yeah, oh, thanks for the hat, Josh. Well, oh you yeah, to, you you have a hat. Excellent. You got to know who to ask. I have <laughs> the hat. I now have the bike spa going. By the way, so in addition to chain spa, I have bike spa now. I oh, excellent! Yeah, you you inspired the spa in the bike spa. Like yes, uh, I was hoping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that was we're like, eh, we like that. That works. So. By the way, the detox is magic. I don't know what Isn't you're that doing cool? there. That stuff <laughs> I, I could now. Now my bikes are are pretty clean to begin with they're not terrible how are they for a deeper clean say you've got a rider who just is neglecting their their machine will it is it, it a two yeah pass, three it really pass will i mean and, how- and, and you may have to scrub you know the whole idea is that it, it you don't have to scrub but if it's yeah. really bad you're going to need to scrub um yeah you know the the thing that it's missing so you know most most brake cleaners have acetone in them or, or right. some actually use like chlorinated solvents and all that stuff. It wants to wick into bearings and it can damage seals. And so we took that out. So like, it's, it's really, really good at cleaning and degreasing, but you know, it's not so good that it it's degreasing your bearings. Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. if it's like really terrible, you may have to, um, do a little scrubbing. The, the other thing we've seen that it, 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 you know, so it won't hurt wax on purpose, right? So like you can spray it on your wax chain uh-huh. and it will not attack the wax at all. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. but the one, the other thing it struggles with is, you know, some of the polymer based lubes, like the Dumontex and those sorts of products, mm. you know, like mm. if those are a year old, they actually harden to like a, a hard polymer <laughs> plastic coating on the chain, um, uh-huh. that that's full of dirt. And, and that can just be a, uh, you know, a bastard to scrape off. Um, and it, yeah. it's not, it, it's not quite strong enough to like you know, take that off like a, like an automotive brake cleaner would be, but at the same time, like an automotive brake cleaner can also take the paint off your bike pretty quickly. So sure. So it, sure. It's, it's that fine line, but yeah, it's definitely meant to be more yeah. of a, um, uh, a, a monthly or, or bi-monthly or even quarterly cleanup of a, of a bike that's well loved and cared for and not like the thing the shop mechanic is using to take care of that, you know, 17 year old, Schwinn that gets brought in for for <laughs> yeah, that repair right. like you know that's been sitting there collecting dust and dirt and was never cleaned when it was you know when it was being ridden 15 years ago so yeah but, no that's good to yeah. hear we we had a lot of fun I've, I've never product, had so but. much fun washing bikes like i i started <laughs> i washed mrs hottie's first and I went man that thing looks terrific and I immediately the next day i did my niner which was full of uh, L.A. dirt and dust and from the Santa Monica Mountains. And then I've done my old Choach, and the Choach has never looked better. And that's a 1987 bike with Ooh, not nice, a great nice, paint beautiful. job um, and some, you know, chromed fork blades and so forth. And they've, mm, mm. they're have sparkling nicely, too. And we, we went for a nice beach bike path ride yesterday, and we were easily the, the hottest things on the bike path. So <laughs> um, they look so tr- awesome. I've not used the, um, the Renew yet. Um, so that's the only thing I have not. Would Renew be okay, though, if, say, you go for a dusty trail ride and you come back with dust and you didn't have time to do a full wash? Yep. Could oh, you yeah. do the Renew yeah. on? You can. Okay. Yeah. So the key the key to the Renew is it's got that same surfactant that does the, like, the lift and encapsulate thing that we talk about. Um, so you yeah. just want to spray it on the bike and Oops, then sorry. give it a minute mm-hmm. to, like, wet the dust and lift it and encapsulate it. Because, like, okay. if you spray it on the rag and then go to wipe you know, it's, you're wetting the top of the dirt, but you're just rubbing the dry dirt against the paint. Yeah. Um, yeah. and you don't want that, okay. but, uh, yeah, just spray it on, wipe it off. The the thing that's cool with the renew is it actually leaves the paint feeling even slicker than the graphene wax does. Um, uh. and so it's kind of, it, that one's kind of fun. Cause like you do it and like, if you pick a tube and you do it and then you flip the towel and wipe it with the dry side, it's like, Ooh, wow. That's, <laughs> that's super okay. slippery. But, um, I might anyway, just do before it just we go too far, then. though, I, I have yeah. to get – we have the, the Silka Shop Dog in today. Yes. He's here, so I have to move Hello. him so he doesn't start barking at me. But hold on. I'll introduce you. He's yeah. so cool. A big reveal. YouTubers, 
A YouTube exclusive. We have a special guest, right? I mean, we need to have the shop dog's own fee. I mean, just a drum roll or something. Right. So good. There we go. Aw. Get this up. So this is Rico. He's our Rico. shop dog. <laughs> hey, buddy. So Rico is 15. He's blind. Wow. Oh. And he is the sweetest guy you can imagine. So he just mostly lays about the shop protecting things. Oh. Uh, and then begging for okay. food when he – so he's blind, but he has super-duper hearing for uh, rappers, like food rappers. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, come lunchtime, uh, like he just walks the place uh, essentially stealing little bits of food from everybody, getting treats. So how is he getting around? Recognize, oh, he's amazing. I mean, yeah, no, it's so amazing. He, he's um, got the place mapped out in his head. Exactly, yeah, and, and we feel terrible that we actually just rearranged the office and put some, like, cubicle oh, no. walls in because we, we hired – up to employees since last time mm-hmm. we talked and um and so he's totally has to remap so like he he trots with total confidence like he looks like he's sighted when he's walking and then we rearrange the office and the poor guy's just running into everything oh <laughs> we feel so bad but but he's so fluffy that he he doesn't seem to um to get hurt but yeah he's but but anyway so that's uh there you go say hi rico hey rico, hi, rico. Oh, all right that is awesome uh, I'm going to I'm going to take him and put him elsewhere cuz if he when when he does want something he lets you know. <laughs> or when knows. <laughs> yeah. So honey, while we're waiting for mm-hmm. uh for Josh to come back in, I mean, you had a lot and I have a lot that I didn't even get into this. Yeah, I, I mean, do you want? Okay. Is there stuff that you want to talk about in the in the pre-show, in the post-show? Um, yeah, I saw a full show there in the script, so I didn't think. Oh, there there's was a, a reason full show. Add. Yeah, I'm I, like, you know, I put my hour record, uh, shortened version in there, mm-hmm. uh, in the in the you know in the script itself, because that's a you know that's a recurring topic for us and something that. <laughs> Um, we love celebrating here, so I thought we would at least spend a few moments talking For about sure. some of the some of the you know the the points that that we've discussed here, and see if anything deserves a little scrutiny. I mean, I think there's a little maybe a little marketing action going on there from Pinarello. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> we'll let Josh decide on that. Um, so there was just that, and you know, I I think we've done it already but talking about the new product from from josh and silka the the cleaning products is sure again i'm you know i'm kind of drooling all over it because Mm -hmm. i I love you know i love how they work um but um you know you gotta send hottie on tour i I know (laughs) seriously right he's with a uh, salesman you're better than my other guys, I'll tell you that. There is <laughs> there is nothing like a committed like someone who believes in your product. I one of the questions that did not make the that is not in the list here, but we can talk about before is another person who uh, sort of mm-hmm. has done the same thing. There's a uh, a bike shop owner uh, who started using your wax and now offers it as a service uh, yeah. from his bike yeah. shop. It's pretty cool. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I no, we've, we've had some really great success with, with mm-hmm. some yeah. shops with that. It's, yeah, it's I mean, pretty awesome. Yeah. Honestly, that's the only way I would ever do it, right? Because I'm I'm the anti hottie. I I'm the yang to hottie's yin. <laughs> <laughs> the anti hottie. I I use your I, I use uh, synergetic all the time, but mm. I've 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 never uh, taken the time to wax the chain, and I'm not going to. But I. Any time that I have is going to be writing, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's there there's a big difference between uh, you know between who you know what pleasure people get from uh, cleaning and taking care of their bikes. I am at the far end, the bad end of the spectrum. <laughs> Josh, I know you made a point regarding the back to the cleaning products real quick. You made a point of saying, look, keep the graphene spray wax away from your brakes right but if it gets yeah. on your drivetrain is it okay it's there? fine yeah no it's fine on is your drivetrain yeah you just right because it's wax brakes. right you just don't want it on your brakes 
Right. And in fact, it right, brings right. up a point, you know, um, and we've talked about this before, too, and it came up when we interviewed Alexi, and that is, you know, the one thing he struggles with, and I've heard this, I've <clears> seen <throat> this before, too, on my own bikes, is with a wax chain, and especially if you run SRAM and one of those wide-range cassettes, you get in that easiest gear, right, the biggest cog on your cassette uh, into a dirt ride, and chances are it's going to start talking to you. Mm. And that's only because you've started to scrape the wax off the links themselves. You've still got great right. penetration, and you're still getting protection where it counts. But for the racer and, and the person who just wants to focus on the riding, they hear that in their ears, and they go, oh, I must be slowing down because I'm hearing a chain, right? That's the natural reaction. So yeah. is there anything that they can do now or that's on the horizon that's maybe going to address how to keep, especially like cassettes from... From build is that a, a static thing, or I mean, is there something that could be done now or in the future? future no, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, we we do have some folks that are will like run the hot wax and then run synergetic over it, um, just to <laughs> kind of you know take some of that up, or you know maybe like break it in and then do a little synergetic on it, and you know it basically softens the wax, but it softens the outer wax, but it doesn't yeah. have enough. Um, th- there's not enough like solvency for it to like like creep down to the, the inside. The, mm-hmm. the downside is you, you still get back to that um, wet lube versus dry lube trade off yeah. of, you know, now you're, you're back to attracting more dirt than you would have been attracting. Right. But, right. but yeah, I mean the, the wide range cassettes really uh, make things difficult. And I, I do think that's, that's one of the ways too, where like the Shimano um, chains really shine is that they, they're, they're a lot more chamfered on that inner edge than yeah. most other brands, if not all the other brands. And so you're just reducing some of those local, the pressures uh, that are in play there. But yeah, you are losing a little bit of, of efficiency. Like if you can hear it, it's that's not good. Yeah. Um, but you're still generally, you know, uh, you, you look at how quickly drivetrain friction climbs with time once you start adding dust to it. Um, you know, your chain can be super quiet, but way less efficient. Um, full of dirty lube, right, than it, than it is with the wax. And so that's part of the trade-off of, like, you know, how much sound is bad? Is it – I would say in most cases as we've studied it, particularly for dry, uh, you know, like 100-mile or less type racing, your your drivetrain is finishing out far more efficient than it would be with a, with a wet lube in, mm-hmm. in the same conditions, even if you can hear it. Um, right. You know, now you yeah, start yeah. talking about, like, you know, five hours in the rain um, – you know, like a, a synergetic may actually be the better lube for for something like that, or you know, the the unbound three hundred mega triple XL or whatever that thing is. Um, you know, because the other advantage with like the uh, you know the synergetic is like you can add it and and just ride. You know, like all of the dry lubes and the the um, emulsified waxes and stuff all have like you know twelve hour drying periods. So, or you can you know, like if I were to do unbound, I would. I would hot wax and then carry mm-hmm. a, a synergetic carry. and synergetic. You yep. know, I was about if, to say, if yep. you really need it, you just start hosing it on there. Yeah, um, I was about to say that's exa- well. That's that's all uh, will be the fatty plan, I think, for next Leadville. Is we'll do him hot wax to start, and I think he'll he'll easily make it. But we'll have we'll have synergetic in the pit just in case he needs it. But or if it rains or something yeah. stupid. But I think that's the approach for him. So fatty. Get yourself a hot wax chain. If you have to buy one pre-made off Ashoka, <laughs> whatever it takes, get one. You'll love it. I'll beg for one. Yeah, oh, the guy I need to it. beg. The guy I need to beg just left. Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm back now. I'm back. <laughs> or give me more uh, of a heads up than the week before. I think you told me the week before. Hey, bring your crock pot with you. I'm bring my crock. Bring my. <laughs> <laughs> and all my cleaning products and all that? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Everything. Uh, what no. kind of crew are you? Oh, Should God. have anticipated Please. that. Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Anyhow. Oh, very good. Loving right. the chain spa. Loving the bike spa. Been, been, been a lot of fun. Oh, good to hear. Yeah. It, it is funny that being, being at the Philly this weekend and, and, you know, it's such a hard product to sell to most people and, you know, they, their eyes glaze over and... <laughs> So we just started going like, like, hold on, you're like me at the dentist when they talk about flossing, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? And they're like, yeah, I never clean my bike. Like, okay, like, we will move on. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good analogy. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, goodness. Okay, let me silence my phone or actually turn it off. No, uh-huh. I should do that. Sure. My phone's always silent, though. And then let's see. While we're uh, getting ready to do the, the audio podcast. Okay. Um, oh, Josh, did Michael Lieberson ever get a hold of you? He's with Endurance Innovation Podcast. Did you guys ever touch bases? Hook up? We, oh, God, I think we did. I think I talked. I'm sorry. I do so many of these things, and I'm so bad yeah, at names that I... Um, you were on the we um, the Gravel Ride pro- podcast recently with Craig Dalton. I heard you there. Let's see. And you're on a YouTube one, too, that I'm still watching. <laughs> but Michael, no, I told Michael, not Michael was the guy I... Yeah. With that one, okay. I've, I've not done anything with him, so yes, I, we, we need to get that on the, on the list. I all but promised him I would I would help get you on his show since he okay. came on ours to talk about aerometers. Okay, now yeah, so I will. See, he has not posted in a while, but I, I'll see what's up with him and if he's still wanting to do. I know he sent an email to you, oh, like a, within the month. Yeah, I can see we, we traded emails, but nothing. Okay, nothing. Else, okay, so all right. I just want to make sure that I keep following up on that in case he's still interested. I'm pretty sure he is. So, All right. Um, and, you know, one of the ideas I had for the show was Trevor's um, unbound effort. I think that's pretty intriguing since he has access to you and all, the, all things marginal gains. I kind of heard maybe doing something with him, you know. Oh, Travis. About, like. Travis, Travis. I'm sorry. I wrote yeah, yeah, Trevor. Yeah, sorry. 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 No, you just that. sent me off, sorry. and I'm like, oh, God, I don't think I know any Travers. Yeah, Travis. I wrote down Travis. Okay. I don't know why. Um, but is he doing something on his own for the YouTube channel? I didn't quite understand what was going he, on Yeah, there. he's I mean, he's doing it through, um, you know, through kind of the Marginal Gains Network um, and, and the usual suspects. And But it's, yeah, it's him. He and Michelle are, like, writing and producing and directing the whole thing so i I honestly it's kind of fun to watch like like content's being created and i have nothing to do with it that's okay um awesome but but yeah all all i can say about that is we 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 all just wanted to call silka's biggest loser (laughs) (laughs) we we had like 10 of those that were all like terribly insulting to to young travis but uh, oh yeah yeah but no he, he i i think they just finished shooting like a second or third episode and um but yeah you you should uh, reach out to Michelle and and see you know what we want to strategize if, if anything around that because I know he's yeah maybe he's on the audio side on. yeah maybe on the audio okay. side we can just do something audio only and let them handle the the YouTube side and okay. there might be something yeah, that Fatty and I could could uh, hook up with him maybe you know before and kind of how as he starts his build and thinking about what kind of marginal gains he might incorporate and then after the race certainly after the race I think we'd want to do some type of follow up with him and. Hey, how'd it go? What what worked? What what, what didn't? Something like that. So, okay, cool. Well, I'll follow up with them. That's fine. Cool. That's all my. And I won't right. call him Trevor. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say I'm super excited for that one too because I think it just is like, you know, he's a whatever thirty year old dad of a two year old who's taken two years off, you know, to like help raise the baby, and he works a full time job, and and. It was kind of cool. He's like, "Hey, we've got access to all these like really knowledgeable people about this stuff." You know, yeah. I think, and I'm like, I th- I think there's a ton of people out there in similar situations who uh, yes, yeah. who would love to you know see that. Right? It's not you know, it's like oh, I got a training program off the internet and it's 24 hours a week on the bike. <laughs> like, yeah, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Um, no, no, it's not. Okay. All right. So, Josh, this will be this will be fun. Um, I figured things out so that I can <clears throat> play the voicemails as we are recording. So you Ooh, that's no cool. longer having to read them and have Hottie drop them in later. Although Hottie, you're welcome <clears throat> to also drop them in later if they sound better that way. But for our YouTubers, they won't have to just imagine the the. Uh, the voicemails. So, mm-hmm. 
learning so much. Yeah, that's that's audio. awesome because that has been pointed out to me. They're like, oh, that's really awkward when you guys get to the voicemail question and you're all like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're all pretend <laughs> listening to something that isn't there. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> Josh's yeah. volume well, just Josh's volume just kicked up in a big way there. Did you hear that, Fatty? I did not. No, yeah. It sounded insane to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right. Well, question down, yeah. is. Is is there a way in here for me to like turn my own sound down without keeping yours? Like if I if I'm adjusting on the mic, I'm turning all of us down. You, but I am super loud to me right now. And so you guys are kind of quiet. What are your headphones plugged into? The mic the road microphone. The road microphone. I does it have And it's I think it's got your like a little volume audio. knob that I can Yeah. Yeah, I can Adjust, yeah, go. I you should be able to do that. That should not affect your gain on this. Let's see how that sounds. Okay, how about... Oh, maybe I just need to go further. Now you guys talk. Okay. How do we sound now? We still, yeah, are we okay now? You still can right hear us? I mean, all yeah, you gotta do is just... Any difference? Yeah. Can you no, hear us like, at all? Not we lost at all. If I, turn, if I turn me down. Okay. How about if you just adjust your Mac volume? I'm at max. Because right now, you guys are those quiet. headphones are your speakers. We're too uh, quiet now? Uh, I, I but, can your audi- but your audio... I just don't, like, I just don't like listening to myself be loud. Yeah, all you want to be able to... You do want to be able to hear yourself, Josh, so you can hear if <laughs> you're getting too far off mic or too close, like so. Hmm. It just helps you regulate a little bit, but not so much that it's killing you. Or you want to be able to hear anything like... Oh my God! I'm having a short or something like that, you know. Or right. I clearly right. don't have the right mic routed, like what happened with Dan the one time, and this right. would just help with all that stuff, right? So. Okay. Yeah. No. But, I, I, um, I there's got to be a I way just to hear balance. myself too clearly. I, I yeah. Think no. No. And that'll make what that'll do is that'll make you gun shy too when you talk. You'll be like, mm. you'll start talking quieter, and that's no good. There's got to be a. Yeah, I would say in the Mac turn down the the. Um, right, Fatty. The volume on oh, the okay. Mac. Mm-hmm. Like in settings, so the yeah. Mac volume that should be. So, uh, what version of the OS are you using? You using Ventura? Have oh, you upgraded hold on. Let to me, Ventura? Let me try this road. Let me see what the road. Because you should be able to bring your uh, volume, the volume on your control panel, down. Oh, there we go. Okay, let me. Yeah. I, what I can do is I I can turn you guys up, right? Okay. And then and you can turn, can turn the whole volume down. And yeah. I can turn me to, turn everything down on here. Turn okay. everything down. So awesome. turn us up and then turn the right. Yep. I do that. Okay. And then Keep you can talking. hear us and you don't have. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. This is great YouTube content, by the way. I'm sure. Oh yeah, no, people are gonna this. love this. That's like, oh, they did five minutes of sound checking. I uh, know. Hey. <laughs> I know. Is, the raw is raw. Play Stairway these to are, Heaven. No. Come on. Hey, honestly, folks, these are marginal gains. These are hotties marginal <laughs> gains. I am the guy driving all this BS right now, uh, driving Josh up the wall. I've already done it to Fatty for years. Like, you got to get on a good mic. you got to treat your room. you got to – That's all. I will cop to that. As Josh but, is passionate about keeping your bike clean and your chain waxed and building the best uh, <laughs> titanium cleats and parts possible, that's the way I am with – audio for the most part that is true so okay I will no, this is much better margin. okay good good this is Josh, much have you Thank upgraded you. to ventura on the I, mac the os i'm gonna say no the latest version okay it's when you do i need to make sure that you um there's a oh, mic yeah. mode change that um i was unaware of that i want to make sure that we have turned off on your mic as well but okay. if you haven't upgraded to Venture, it's not something to worry about yet. Okay. But when you yeah, do, when you, up, mm-hmm. when you take an hour to upgrade your OS sometime, uh, afterward, let's make sure we talk before we record again. It'll only take a okay. minute. Nope. Sounds great. Honest. Honest. Okay. Um, okay. And do you have, what is it you're using to record now, Josh? Um, Audacity, right? Oh, God. One of the odd... I and think it is audacity. Search it every time. Yeah, we want to make sure you bring that up so you can record locally. Although your local recording with Riverside is pretty good. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, audacity. Yeah, this is the part of the YouTube where people are always like, "That guy seems so high tech," and then he's such a <laughs> he's such a luddite with like the computer and the. Uh, hey, we're all good at what we're good skip. at. Skip. 
Yeah, it is Audacity. Okay. Oh, good. So Let's go ahead and get, get rid of Because right? I've got like three other odd beginning softwares on here that yeah. the other two don't work, so uh, I need to just delete them. Yep, Audacity. Since Audio Hijack won't work for me. Uh, okay, there we go. I am ready. Road Podcaster, oh, Road Podcaster, better. one mono. Yep, no, I'm, uh, okay. I'll start. All right, backup is rolling. Okay. Um, Hi, AJA27. Starting a new file myself. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Locked and loaded. Just one sec. Willing and able. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and record, and let's go ahead and do our countdown. Okay. This, and you're recording be... too, Josh. And What's that? We're all oh, yeah, I'm recording. Yep. Okay, and then we're all recording, or I'm already recording in Riverside. Okay, all redundancies are in place. <laughs> okay, ask Rock Josh anything. Roll. Number twenty-seven, Marginal Gains Podcast. Five, four, three, three, three two, 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 one, one. one. All right. Sorry about that, YouTube. We'll get the show underway now. New policy, never ap apologize to YouTube. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the raw <laughs> is uncooked. If the YouTube commenters <laughs> are the most prolific, though. They, they will come at you first, so that's why you apologize. You have to get on your knees. Okay, here we go. Episode 84, HA27. This is the Marginal Gains Podcast, presented by Stilka, and this is a show that makes a big deal about the little things and how those little things can be a big deal. I'm Michael Houghton, also known as Hottie. And I'm Josh Portner from Stilka. And I am Fatty, also known as Fatty. <laughs> I am going to steal our Shimano promotion spot to beg for something. Uh, Shimano, <laughs> please, send me a pair of your new RX-801 gravel <laughs> racing shoes. I have been staring at these non-stop they are stiff uh they are lightweight they're beautiful shoes and i would say i would contend that they are not just for gravel racers who are interested in marginal gains but people like me cross-country racers interested in a comfortable light shoe with the famous shimano range of fits 43 wide just in case you're wondering shimano <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you're listening, Germano. Uh, yeah, and I'm I'm pretty sure those would pair nicely with a set of uh, Silka 3D printed titanium cleats. Oh, yes. I believe you are Maybe right, Maybe Shimano Josh. will get those for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need them to because I have a set in a box waiting uh, for when I get these shoes. Uh, I actually have put a full season now into my first pair of 3D uh, Thai Silka cleats. And I've got another pair ready to go. Love those cleats, by the way, Josh. They've been, I, I usually, I, do, I, well, I shouldn't say usually, I have never gotten through a season with a single set of cleats before. These, just fine. It's good to hear. Don't feel like they are starting to get, you know, the, when there's that end of the curve where you're like, ah, I think these are okay. And it's like, you know what? You are going to start pulling the foot out of your, out of your pedal exactly. soon, dude. Uh, well, that's good to hear. That is good to hear. Yeah. Well, for the 3D printed tie cleats mentioned, it's Silka.cc. And yep. for the best cycling shoes in the biz, it's bike.shimano.com. One last note. I want the tropical leaves. <laughs> uh, Shimano. He, he just, keeps going. Just saying. Oh, oh they, they go so nice with my frame. Holy what yeah. is that beggars can't be choosers thing <laughs> saying I once heard? <laughs> hey, this is the episode 84 of the Marginal Gains Podcast, our 27th in the Ask Josh Anything series, and we've had a lot of great questions from our listeners. All right, deep breath. Let's go. All right, Josh. I got a first question. I'm jumping the line. What is the most <laughs> marginal gain you've ever seen? Your marginalist gain. Uh, is, if we were Ooh. going to, you know, divide gain by effort 
either by money or time spent, what's the smallest result that's still measurable that you've ever seen? Mm. Gosh, that's an interesting, um, there's a ton of weight stuff out there. Um, you know, that, that can get into, I mean, some of these parts, you can get into like couple hundred, you know, hundred dollars plus per gram or, you know, a couple hundred dollars for five <laughs> grams or whatever. Um, I, I think as of late, you know, there's, I can't remember who, but there's the, there's a, a Dutch or Belgian company that has like thousand dollar aero socks. And, you know, I think even there, serious? the claimed, the claimed additional benefit over like the $35 aero socks is, you know, 10th of a watt or something. Um, you know, I will definitely say some of the, the claims out there with some of the um, chain treatment, you know, I think what was the, the hour record claim on the chain was $6,000 or something of yeah. tuning and, and whatever. And, and um, you know, when I do the math backwards, knowing some of the numbers, it's like, okay, drivetrain <laughs> efficiency there is, is really not really different than expected. So if there's any gain at all, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it's super tiny. Um, Gosh, yeah, that's a good question. And then what about, I'm trying to think of the effort. The effort one is maybe the most interesting. I mean, I, I think some of the, you know, custom custom clothing, um, custom fitting, custom, you know, s some of that stuff mm -hmm. here, you know, the, it, it well, and I guess it, it depends on the rider, right? So, you know, the, some of those things you, you can put the fastest suit on a rider and, yep, you get that 20 five watts or whatever they claim and sometimes you don't and so maybe, maybe in those cases the you know the eight thousand dollars for the speed suit or whatever that works out to be you know maybe that is worth it for that rider if the stock one doesn't fit but yeah i mean some some of the stuff really you know you can just get off into crazy town um for fractions of a watt so that's maybe, maybe we need to calculate right. on our website or something <laughs> like let's put it on <laughs> let's like stack rank i, I like that and uh oh, I love stack that. rank the uh expense uh, per watt saved or per second saved or something. But then you okay. need to have the additional calculator of the placebo effect, right? Because if mm, I spend yeah. $8,000 on a special custom skin suit for myself, <laughs> I know for sure that the, uh, you know, the arrow advantage it incurs is going to be nowhere near close to how I guess, uh, I guess the, the sense of value that I am yeah. getting, and yeah. we've talked about that before. That you know, the, your brain is the source of the best. You know, some of the best marginal gains. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. I mean, it, it's funny as you're saying that. I, I we had a customer years ago, um, back pretty early in the zip days, and he came and he said, he said, "I just want to say, I, I bought that disc wheel, and I have never ridden so hard in my life because I." I couldn't bear the thought of getting passed by someone without a disc wheel. <laughs> and it was, it wasn't anything like, Oh, that's the best performing wheel. Or, Oh, I said, you know, it was just like, I was terrified to look stupid. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, that's not quite the placebo effect, but I, I'm sure for some people, you know, if I dropped eight grand on a skin suit, I would probably be in the same boat. Absolutely. Um, but, <laughs> Well, maybe the most expensive might be connected to our next topic here, and that is a favorite one of ours, the hour record and the bike that was used in that hour record. And since we did our last Ask a Josh Anything, the hour record has been broken again. The last time three wow. of us spoke, we were discussing Dan Bigum's stellar record yeah. of 55.548 <clears throat> kilometers. As was pretty apparent at the time, Dan was the Ineos setup man for Filippo Ghana who used most of Dan's research and testing and topped Dan's mark by a little more than 1.2 kilometers. He also beat Boardman's best uh, human effort by 400 meters. So now we, we have one record to kind of rule them all. Now, the bike used by both Dan and Filippo has received a lot of attention and maybe uh, should fall under Fatty's category of most marginalist gain ever, and that's at Pinarello Bolidi, Bolidi, Bolide. My, my Italian just isn't that great. I say -O -O bolide. I D E is how it's spelled. <laughs> bolide? Okay. Let's call the whole thing off. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's just call it a Pilnerola track bike. How about that? Uh, it was made in five parts on a 3D printer, titanium printer. So this is really the first 3D printed bike to be used um, to capture a record. It'll be used in, in an event. Uh, oh, by the way, folks, if you're wondering about the UCI and about 
their new rules that came out. Technically, that bike would have been not eligible for Dan's record attempt because it was still prototype, but would have been eligible for Filippo's attempt. So they, they kind of walked the line a little bit there. And, and when push came to shove, Dan, I heard Dan talk about this. He said, look, we could have gotten the bike out, quote, unquote, on the marketplace in time to, to qualify for these, these new regulations by the UCI. But I digress, right? A great deal of focus though, has been on this bike, this record-setting bike. In particular, Josh, it's seat post and seat tube sections. You know, the print job put these interesting fins on the, on the forward portion of the post and seat tube. And Pinarello says they got this idea from examining whales, I think humpback whales. Now, uh, I don't know if they have a marine biologist on staff at Pinarello, but okay, I, I guess I can buy some of this. Um, they also said that this section of the bike actually accounts for 40% of equipment drag, which this is where my eyes and eyebrows kind of were raised a little bit. Oh, yeah, 40%? That sounds like an awful lot, Josh. What is your, What is all your testing showing you about seat tube and seat post sections of bicycles and and how much we're we're dealing with there as far as drag yeah i mean there's depending on how you slice the bike they're they're right i mean if you think of uh and we gosh when back in 2011 matt goto and and a group of uh, some engineers at Zip and myself pu- published a paper for the AIAA. i can't remember the name of it but um one of the things we did in there was essentially laser scan the the complete bike and then use the cfd to assign the relative drag values to all the components and you know i think if you think of it from a perspective you know if i take a you take the bike you draw a vertical line say through the middle of the crank set and look at everything behind that that's that's probably 40 percent of the drag right and and Mm -hmm. that's also to say that everything in front of that is 60 percent of the drag uh equipment drag um and and that makes sense you know you've got all the handlebars and the fork and the front wheel, they're all, you know, cutting theoretically clean air. Um, and then, so you, in a way they're saying, you know, you have, it, it's slightly less important back there, but it's still important. Um, you know, the, the, the turbulators, uh, leading edge turbulators or, you know, the humpback whale tubercles or whatever, um, you know, that, there is a lot of study that's come from that and and you know we've seen it zip use that in their nsw marketing and um you know i have no doubt that was somewhat inspirational in this except you know from a sort of inside baseball perspective you know the the, this bike was patented over a dozen years ago um by a group out of australia and then kind of a funny like coming full circle um dimitris katsanis at, at metron uh, in the UK, who's a, a really great friend of mine. Um, he's the guy that actually developed and patented the wavy ID bicycle rim, like what we know is the, the now zip 404, um, and the, uh, what's her name's Princeton wheels. Um, that's actually Demetrius's patent. Um, and in that patent, you know, hmm. there is actually a reference to this other bike patent, um, where they show, you know, you can look it up. It shows what looks a whole lot like the Pinarello. So, you know, I think to me, this is much more of somebody just actually executing on a, a really clever design from from a while ago. I think, you know, sadly for them, uh, you know, I think I haven't looked at the, the dates, but I think it's at least 12 years old, maybe more. And, of course, you know, patents are good for 17. So, uh, I mean, heck, it could be long enough ago that it's off patent and, and you know, they might not even be paying a license or anything to, to do what they did. But but what I will say is we know, you know, those sorts of leading edge turbulators are really good at handling yaw, which you don't have a ton of on the track, but they're also really good at handling um, turbulent flow. And you do have a lot of that in between the rider's legs. Um, so I, I, I would say I have little doubt um, that these are, are doing at least something, um, you, you know, judging just by looking at them the way they're placed and um, positioned and you know i i know all the folks over in this project super well and there there are some really smart folks involved so um <laughs> yeah. you know it's it's always hard to know like what if the numbers are real and and that can go both ways <laughs> you know i had had somebody actually at the uh philly bike expo this weekend talking about the the zip chrono crank and he said ah did you guys really lie about the watt savings and like underquote it by a, you know, like less than half of what it really was. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, we, 
you know, we struggled to believe it. And we knew if we put that in our marketing, people would be like, they're full of shit. Um, <laughs> and so we, you know, it was whatever, 25 watts. And we said it was eight or something like that. Um, you know, I, I would say it's not it's not in anyone's best interest generally to overstate the watt mm-hmm. savings of something like that, it, especially if there's any chance that it's ever going to get made. Because um, I guarantee you, even if this thing is, you know, $75,000 for a frame, the first person that buys it is going to be peppered with requests to take it to the wind tunnel. <laughs> and so there's, <laughs> right. you know, there's really, there is no value or advantage in, in Pinarello or the team or anybody else overstating that, um, you, you know, in this case, because they're all so c- close to it. You know, it's a little bit different than, you know, I think we've talked before about like the Nike Swift Spin suit for Lance that, you know, they claimed was like three minutes per 40K. And of course, you know, that's, you know, at the end of the day, they don't really give a crap what people think about Lance. You know, I look at that and say, God, they're basically saying that, you know, Lance would be three minutes slower than Ulrich if he wasn't wearing this suit. You know, that, like that's kind of a crappy thing to do to your athlete. But of course, Nike was doing that to sell, you know, a bajillion dollars of running and, and soccer clothing and stuff, right? And, and you know, they had almost no business in cycling. So, um, yeah. So anyway, yes, I have tested ideas like this in the wind tunnel numerous times. I can be sure that it works. And I mean, just looking at that bike and some of the, the level of integration, um, you know, the, the frontal area reduction, the, the, the positioning work, I mean, all of that, I, I find it to be believable. I've, I've also kind of reversed all the math, um, and, and the numbers work out, you know, I, Good. we actually were joking here, uh, you know, within the company, the morning that happened, our guys were like, Oh, what do your numbers say? You know, they're saying he's gonna, and you know, it was so funny, like, you know, my numbers were predicting him to be like, you know, four to 500 meters beyond what they were, they were saying he would do. And of course he went, I don't remember the exact numbers now, but he, you know, they, they were saying like 55, two, and I'm like, I'm getting 55, six, 55, seven. <laughs> and he goes 55, you know, five, five or, or Right from memory, is that that's what that was like? No, Gangana went fifty six no. seven nine two. Yeah, fifty six seven nine. Okay, yeah. Right. So, um, but yeah, so we whatever the numbers worked out to be, we were calculating it to be, I think, two hundred to four hundred meters beyond what uh, what the team was saying, and we were closer to right than they were. So, I, again, I think it's in their best interest to underestimate a little bit, um, and there's certainly no benefit in them overstating, right? Uh, overstating that. Yeah, at some level too, you know, if if they said, oh, you know, he's got a, you know, a, a point, you know, this gets him to a one four five CDA, and you'd look and be like, oh, well, that's a not a very impressive power number, and of course we know that's an impressive power number required <laughs> to do what he did. Um, so I think from the the marketing spin perspective, you know, there there are some balancing forces in this equation that you don't maybe necessarily have with. All cycling marketing, let's mm-hmm. say that. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean to belittle what Ineos and Pinarello and certainly Dan have done in this effort. I mean, it's been remarkable overall, the, the combined efforts. Their work in thermoregulation alone has been just amazing. Like, they, you yeah. know, they did things like chilled Ghana's helmet before he went on the track. Um, both athletes warmed up, and this is kind of funny to say, warmed up in cooling vests. All to kind of delay all that heat yeah. build up in the body, so they would be fresher further into the further in the event. Dan was actually a better better negative splitter than Filippo mm. was, and had I think Filippo been able to negative split like Dan did, then your calculation probably yeah. comes true, Josh. If not more, you know, then fifty seven k definitely comes comes into the mix there, which. I, I would think is probably hanging over the Italian's head a little bit at this point. One marginal gain that he did not use that was Dan's suggestion was a light or white colored skin suit. Now Filippo was he was determined to wear black. He wanted a dark bike, black bike, he wanted a black suit, he wanted that, you know, kind of that I guess that Italian mystique look. Um, Dan's thinking was, hey, wear the lighter color skin suit. Again, more thermoregulation, right? You're gonna be able to reflect yeah, or get yeah. rid of that heat a little bit easier and um, it's gonna go towards it. Speaking of uh, heat and um, atmospheric conditions, actually Ghana's atmospheric conditions were slightly worse. The, the uh, velodrome was the same, Grenchen, right? We've talked about this mm-hmm. place a little bit, 500 meters up, not a bad spot. It seems to be that sweet spot between going higher or sea level where Bradley Wiggins was. Uh, atmospheric conditions for Filippo's effort were just slightly worse. In fact, at the same wattage, 
had he had Dan's conditions, would have probably gotten about another 200 meters. And it's funny to look at Bradley's situation, Josh, which I know you're a Oof. part of. Like, had Bradley just gone to Grinchin or any place better, had any type yeah. of better weather, like, because Bradley had yep. nearly the same yep. type of wattage that Filippo put out. Like, Bradley yeah. could have gone so yeah. much farther, just in the right spot, right, or on the right day, for God's sakes. Oh, and he got so be frustrated. Yeah, I mean, he was here. so burned. Oh. Yeah, so burned yeah. Mm-hmm. By, by the, totally the, you burned know, by the, 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 the beyond the sea level thing. Yeah, just the. Oh, that uh, high pressure front that that moved in, but yeah, yeah, but again, now, again, not to take from Ghana, it was amazing. No, in fact, uh, they were so tied up on atmospheric conditions and and getting the most out of these conditions that they even thought about bringing in dehumid dehumidifiers to the Grinch and Velodrome to try and bring the humidity down, so they could keep the right temperature, keep it warm enough, but but reduce humidity, so. So the athlete doesn't mm-hmm. suffer as much, you know. In the end, the, the size of the the equipment you'd have to bring in to to reduce humidity in, in a velodrome, you know, gets to be a little right, ridiculous. Right. And as it turned out, you know, it just wasn't the conditions didn't didn't warrant it either. But the one thing that I noticed, Josh, um, and that uh, our friend Ronan McLaughlin also noticed because he was there at the effort is that so Ghana, as opposed to Dan, allowed fans in, and fans were allowed to be fans except once the effort started. And once Ghana got rolling, they told fans, you have to sit still. No moving. Mm. Why would they do that? Oh, God, probably a couple of reasons. I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, we, we have seen, uh, I mean, 100%. And it, it was really the uh, Alpha Mantis track uh, testing system that Andy Francione and, and his team developed. I mean, this was, God, 15 years ago. I mean, really taught us just how sensitive these things were. I mean, you, you could have, uh, uh, you know, person standing too close to the, the, to the black line as you ride past and you get a little blip in the, the CDA, wow. <laughs> right? Um, you know, you, you could see if there was another rider high on the track riding slowly. Um, you could actually see the effect of that when the, the, the rider on the black line was passing at speed. Um, you, you can actually see in that data uh, this effect we call stirring the drink. And that's that, you know, the, it, is, it takes uh, 10 laps or so, but, you know, you actually kind of get a little bit of a, of a swirl in the airflow um, that's moving in the direction of the rider on the track. Um, and so the apparent CDA actually comes down once you're effectively, you know, stirring the drink. Um, it, 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 it's crazy how sensitive it is. So you, you can think from that perspective, you know, you know, cheering, waving, signs, flapping, you know, those stupid balloon <laughs> things that people smack in the, you know, you think of like anything that people would do at like, you know, a sports ball event, um, you know, could, could have some effect, right? And I think we have to err on the side of like whatever effect it's going to have is – you know, it, it, it's probably more likely to be negative than positive. So let's mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. But but either way, we haven't studied it. So like, let's not go there. Um, mm-hmm. And then the other one, it, I think, could is just from a sheer distraction perspective. You know, if if people right. are randomly, you know, uh, you know, uh, random person in the bright orange, you know, uh, shirt is getting up to go get a hot dog. Um, you know, as the riders passing, I mean, it, it's it's just one more thing in your field of view to distract, right? That, mm-hmm. that, you know, you need laser focus, you know, those guys in their heads are, you know, they're, they're essentially counting the entire time, um, you know, to try to, because they have no data. You know, I think if they had data, it could, yeah. be, it could be quite different. You know, you just Chris Froome it, stare at the stem and, you know, go 440 Watts. Yep. I can, <laughs> I'm still good. I'm still good, but, but they don't have that luxury. And so, uh, you know, I think, I, I think that those two factors combined um, make a big difference. And then the, the third one I would, would throw in there is, you know, if there's like a lot of um, shouting, screaming, clapping activity, people's respiratory rates go up and they're breathing more. And that's going to both warm and humidify the air. Um, <laughs> and and they, they didn't mm. really want either of those things to happen. <laughs> right. So, yeah. you know, so. A whole bunch of people sitting super still with kind of it, chill respiratory rates um, are, are absolutely the, the the best thing that that he could have because nothing yeah. else was modeled into that. I, I promise you. Yeah, they did I allow mean, the cheering, but the, the the fans were told specifically stay in your seats, no moving around, mm-hmm. and that probably goes to your 
your first two points there, Josh, is, yeah, you could disrupt the CDA a little bit. You could distract the rider a little bit. Is there anything to the atmospheric conditions that a, a moving body could, I mean, I, you know, we're talking about really minute stuff here, I'm sure, but. I mean, I think if you were, if you were really, um, you know, gaming the system, you would have all of your fans, um, you know, walking the perimeter of the uh, at the top of the track in the direction that the rider is moving, right? <laughs> Just to keep the help, air, you know, give uh, you a little bit of additional drink stirring, um, mm-hmm. you know, a little a little bit higher in the air column uh, than where hmm. the rider is riding. But uh, you know, I you know, people talk about this stuff all the time, but like, oh wow, you know, I, w- I wonder if you could, you know, move the. Um, uh, the HVAC system, you know, if you kind of like added some directionality to the airflow and the, the HVAC ventil- and the ventilation. Um, a cyclone effect. You know, there's yeah. a million cool ideas like that that you could really think about. It, it's, you know, a little bit like, uh, you, you know, it, it gets you thinking kind of like a NASCAR, you know, like all the cool ways you can cheat. Yeah. <laughs> it's sometimes it, more fun than the actual thing itself. It, it, but uh, It would be fun ahead. to have a – it would be fun to have a uh, a cheat uh, one hour attempt where it's like, okay, go ahead and you can look at the bike computer and you can listen to Metallica and y- everyone in the in the stadium is going to do the wave the entire time, just put you know with them standing up and waving you forward to create a cyclone effect as you go around. I mean, how much would that I, change? I mean, how much I, would it be any I faster? Like it. A I, little bit, a half a second? <laughs> Yeah, I think it could. I mean, I think it could potentially be. I mean, depending on how far you're willing to take it. I, I, I would say the the first time using the Alpha Manus track system, the first time we ever realized like you had this weird jump, like a step function in drag, um, on a rider mid ride for no reason, and then finally someone went, oh, that the air kicked on, and you're all looking up going, oh my god, <laughs> like. You know, this is like at the L.A. Velodrome, you've got these super high ceilings and it's this enormous space. And, you know, I mean, it it wasn't, you know, I mean, they're just, you know, you're kind of like whatever circular, um, you know, kind of trumpet shaped vents way high up in the ceiling like you have in a big warehouse or something. You're like, oh, God, the air kicked on and his CDA jumped, Mm -hmm. you know, six percent or something. Mm -hmm. Um, Didn't see that coming. So, yeah, I got to think you could probably do a lot. I mean, I think, you know, if you had another rider riding high on the track, um, we know that tends to have a a rather positive effect. I think if, you know, you had people doing the wave with some sort of like, you know, hand paddles and they were doing it all in one direction, (laughs) (laughs) doing it all, you know, counterclockwise. Um, But I really think that the the biggest ones could be uh, what you do with the the HVAC system. If if you Mm -hmm. could get a little bit of, circulation in the right direction going within the building in addition to what the rider is doing. Yeah. Tailwind. Yeah. That, that can be real. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, and you, you only have to look at, you know, we talk about, you know, the effective of uh, effectiveness of arrow and, you know, I had someone at Philly bike this week saying, Oh, you know, if, if arrow mattered, they wouldn't put zippers in jerseys, you know, because, you know, you guys say it makes them so slow. And I'm like, well, yeah, but we also don't want them to overheat. And he's mm-hmm. like, well, I think arrow is bullshit. And I'm like, well, you know, there's a number that disproves that. And that number is 15 kilometers. And he's like, what do you mean 15 kilometers? And I'm like, well, that's how much faster Boardman went on his arrow bike than he did on his Eddie Merckx arrow right. bike. <laughs> yeah. You know, and like y- y- you can choose to not care about it, but you, you can't say that it's, you know, that you it's nonsense. It's not there. I mean, yeah. You know, we <laughs> we see the same rider on the same power goes 15k further, and then you take that one further, and you you look at the human powered vehicle hour record, and mm-hmm. it it was just broken recently. And I uh, my encyclopedic uh, number brain is not with me today, <laughs> clearly because I got my uh, my Ghana hour record number wrong. But I mean, it, it's like a hundred kilometers an hour now. I mean, it, I, that's crazy. I can see. And, we and it was done by. Have, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it was done by somebody who's not Ghana, <laughs> right? So I think that's the other one of like, oh crap, what what could Ghana do in a human powered vehicle? Um, but it'll be well over 100k an hour, right? Absolutely. I can tell we are going to have to do a whole episode at some point of all the ways you know a stack rank top ten ways that we could make a 
our record attempt in a track, you know, make it so it is at least contained in there, how we could make that faster. I I, I think that's Mm -hmm. a whole hour, easily an hour. That could be a series, right? (laughs) A whole (laughs) spinoff, a whole (laughs) spinoff show. Um, Speaking of, I actually do have a follow-up question on the hour record, Josh, and this is sort of one of those crazy hybrids of, you know, our, our record fascination and our crazy hypothetical questions fascination. This came in by text. It is, uh, came to our marginal gains hotline, 317-343-4506. And you're going to note that this is just the first of many voice and text questions we're going to be bringing in from that number. So here is the question. Imagine this, Josh, the year is 2100. Humankind has colonized the moon, and the Moon CI, which is, of course, a sister organization to the UCI, is hosting the oh, first ever outdoor lunar hour record. The record attempt is going to take place on a smooth track and last an Earth hour, but the athlete and the bike will be exposed to the natural conditions on the moon surface. Now, here, here's where it gets interesting. Ignoring how an athlete could breathe, okay, so magically the athlete doesn't need to breathe, and ignoring the physiological homeostasis, I love that our that we are being texted. Someone texted physiological homeostasis. Where was oh, this? You was start? texted? Not even. <laughs> yes, this was I texted. Spell checked this did with that. Uh, it's that's amazing. Awesome. That is so awesome. Somebody so how are you going to make okay. the lunar bike for the outdoor <sighs> lunar record? And what would that bike look like? Outdoor. Ooh. Outdoor. Yes. So. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. It's, wow! Wow! Yeah. So I now I I, I only okay. got this on my third reading that they were talking about an outdoor. I was imagining, you know, can we also design the track right because it one sixth gravity? I was thinking, well, we just make this perfectly circular and bank the hell out of it, and uh, and mm-hmm. that's part mm-hmm. of what I would do with the track. So I think I'm trying to imagine was the was the center of this thinking you know you're riding on the moon on a smooth track in a straight line i think that's what they had in mind honestly since it's a crazy question we can make it up any way we would want so track (laughs) or straight line whatever you think well first of all josh you've got to keep the bike on the surface of the moon because you hit one bump and the thing's just going to go flying off into space yeah well i mean not into space I, i mean you're going to come back down but yeah how do you how do you get started without like burning out for whoever knows how long? You know, how wide are the tires? How soft are the tires? I mean, <laughs> the question's I, insane. Yeah, I, I, and, I think and part a lot of what of makes fun. part of what makes this question so fun is that you know you've completely eliminated the one thing that matters most on Earth, which is the arrow. You saw on the, air on the moon, there's no air resistance, so the bike can be as mm-hmm. CDA heavy as you want right. to make it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with 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 no penalty, um, and you probably. It's a great question to think through. I'd really have to. I, I'd be so. I'm gonna. Yeah, we'll spitball this, and then I actually want readers to come back with like because I know we have so many like physicists. Oh, yeah. and, and scientists that listen to this. But I mean, my my honest thought would be you would want to come up with some sort of. It, it would be a circular track, of. A banking that was just enough to create enough, you know, effective gravity, enough Mm -hmm. G-force to keep the rider on the track. Mm -hmm. Um, And you would want it to be circular because you would want them to be experiencing, you know, a a consistent amount of of force, normal force to the ground. Um, But you wouldn't want it to be too much uh, because you don't need that much gravity. (laughs) Right? Right. and then you would, yeah, you would want the best possible tires, um, and they would have to be super supple because you, you know, I think to, to Hadi's point, any, you know, you you hit a bump and and you will leave the surface, and of course you can't, you know, it's it's kind of like when you look at like the Baja truck racing and that stuff. It's, you know, it looks cool when they're off the ground, but their whole right. goal is to be on mm-hmm. the ground because mm-hmm. that's the only time you can be put, you know, putting propulsive force into the into the tires. You'd want them so, real yeah, wide to... and real soft, wouldn't you? I mean, wider means you're going to have better I... traction, and if you're always banked, you're pushing into, you're pushing them down, and so that you aren't slipping. And you, when you when you hit a uh, you know any kind of bump or any shift in 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 force. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I think you would still you, you would still have to optimize that effective tire spring. You probably want the tires pretty good sized mm-hmm. to have a maximum contact patch and to be able to run them soft enough. I, mean, I think what you would do is you would go out and you would a little bit like you know like the cyclocross pre ride, except you would do it data heavy. You you know instead of like riding your cyclocross loop and, and lowering your pressure until you you start to bottom out. I think you would want to go out there and start lowering, keep lowering your pressure until you st- stayed attached to the track. Yeah. Right. So like whatever track smoothness would drive that effective um, tire spring rate. I mean, rolling resistance is you know really going to be you know one of your only um, retarding forces in the system. Um, so you would optimize the heck out of the tires purely for rolling resistance, which would be so much fun because you'd be like, yeah, drag out the window. <laughs> this is all about CRR. And then you would you would want to go nuts um, removing all the mechanical friction from the system. But yeah, what a what a cool what what a cool thought. I think that the track design would would end up being the track design and the ability to make it sm- uh, smooth enough and then being able to balance those things in, mm-hmm. that, that's a super cool question. What would your gearing be? I mean, that's, I mean it, it one sixth gravity, your gearing could be quite a bit higher. You're, would you change your wheel diameter a lot or a little bit? I mean, since we're getting to design the bikes and we're not having to, is that, you know, would you make it a recumbent? I, I don't know. It's, I, you 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 would just make it whatever you could get the most power into. So, right. Yeah, I mean, and actually, let me let me just while we're here, pardon my typing. I'm going to pull up. Um, <laughs> I'm doing the same thing. I'm, I've found some documents on developing <sighs> wheels for the lunar rovering vehicle, which could be of some assistance, right? Because first of all, what's tire pressure there? I mean, the atmospheric pressure, if Google is correct, I think is 300 trillion times smaller than the Earth's pressure <laughs> at sea level. So this would be a place where, and actually I had a, a big, long discussion with uh, somebody through email, you know, wondering why, like, uh, our our gauges were PSIG, which is PSI gauge versus PSI A, which is absolute. Mm-hmm. Um, and and this would be the place where, you, you know, you, um, you would need to know PSI A, but you would still use PSIG, which is the differential between um, – the ambient and and the the pressure that's inside the tire. Mm-hmm. So, you know the 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 difference in uh, PSIG would be um, equivalent to the PSI A number. Whereas, you know, here on Earth, like at least at sea level, um, you know, those are not the same, right? Mm-hmm. So it's you know, thirteen point seven uh, PSI A is zero PSIG, mm-hmm. um, and that those get to be painful and annoying um conversations to have but <laughs> but uh yeah you i mean you'd still probably you know you'd want to be at i don't know 40 50 psi i mean the, the tire could be huge so you know maybe yeah. you're running at eight psi and it's you know it's like a paper thin fat bike slick tire with um or or hell if if it's a smooth enough track you have so little gravity and if puncture resistance is an issue i mean maybe it's almost just like a like a latex inner tube is your tire. Right. Right. Um, but, but I, I like your idea, Josh, of having our listeners come back to us with their ideas because yeah, they, they're thinkers. And I mean, I, I will tell you that after I was transcribing the questions here and getting them into the script, I, was, I spent the rest of the night thinking about it. So it is, it is so, definitely, uh, okay. our listeners. So I, kind I of just thing. pulled, I just pulled my spreadsheet and hold on when I go just the way we've got the, the cells calculated. So when I go to a zero, um, hold on when I go to point, it, it implodes if I do a, a 0.000 CDA, but if I do it at like, <laughs> if I do it at one, one hundred thousandth, um, assuming the rest of Ghana, I would get, so assuming earth gravity, friction, and 
CRR. Hold on. Oh, shit. I actually have a slide. Um, so, oh, and that's not even very good. So, hold on. I'm sorry. I, I, my defaults are pretty, or, or from whatever I was last calculating, and they're pretty average. Um, oh, man. Oh, yeah. These numbers are, are like, these numbers are sick. <laughs> oh, hold on. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it literally, it, it graphs as it goes, and, like, I'm having to wait because it, it's having to just completely, like, remake the graph from scratch <laughs> because the um, the axes are, are so wrong. Uh, oh, good Lord. Okay. So, holy smokes. Yeah, that's crazy. So, a 75-kilogram rider um, with a 1% drivetrain loss with a 0.000001 CDA and an air density of 00001 um, at 440 watts. Oh, my God. At 440 watts, our projected uh, hour record is 967.99 kilometers. Wow. Yeah, so just under a thousand kilometers an hour. Whoa! Take that, Ghana. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. So, <laughs> just getting up to uh, speed becomes one of the real challenges of this, right? Just because as you are standing and shifting and putting, you know, putting force from zero miles per hour into getting up mm. to speed at one sixth the gravity, your bike is going to be, you know, dancing and skipping all over the place. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, it, uh, yeah, it probably soft. does become because you think your your tires are going to be soft enough that mm -hmm. they're going to bounce under yeah. those starting loads. So it probably does just become a. Um, That's a big chunk of it. Once you're in motion <laughs> and at steady speed, <laughs> then it's uh, you know just a wonder yeah. to watch. Getting to speed becomes, I think, a big chunk of the challenge. Hmm. So obviously, JPL uh, help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. There we go. Let's let's get this done, guys. Thousand kilometers per hour is possible. Yeah. Uh, that, and, and the other that's thing fine. that's that's cool with this is, um, you know, I know the question says like like, you know, assuming we don't have to worry about breathing and all that stuff, but, um, you know, you're going to want mass in the system, um, because that's you know the, the extra mass is actually going to help keep mm -hmm. you on the track. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, we're not the, the aerodynamics of your spacesuit or whatever aren't going to matter. Mm -hmm. Um, you could really do it in a little enclosed, you know, the like human powered vehicle that was a, a pressurized, mm -hmm. um, system, but you would also most likely have very favorable, uh, if you did it right, you would create very favorable, um, uh, temperature uh, in whatever that system is for for cooling the body. So, you know, that, hmm. that, that 440 Watts, you know, maybe becomes, you know, 450 or 460 if you can keep the rider cool. Right. Because I mean, as we know in these things, that ultimately becomes one of the greatest challenges is just, you know, rider body temperature, right? You, Thermal you can regulation. only do yeah. so much for, yeah, you can do so much for so long and then it, it starts to fall off. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ineos just spent, you yeah. know, a great deal, like we said, a great deal of their effort for both uh, Dan and for Filippo, thermoregulation. They really focused hard yeah. on that stuff. And they're on the moon. It's free. It's easy. Yeah. <laughs> just just let yeah. in a little air. Open a vent on your HPV. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun to think, too, you know, with um, – and – not to go too deep, but if you think about it, they you know they could set the the velodrome temperature at whatever they want, and so you know there are calculations being done in the background that are saying, you know, w w you know, warmer air is is faster air for aerodynamic purposes, but it's also worse at thermoregulating the rider, and so you know there are choices that have to be made um, in there relative to the rider CDA, where we say, oh well, it's you know and they're they're relatively small, you know, you're not going to cool it to forty degrees or something in there. Um, but, but I, I think that's an interesting one too, to look at, you know, some of how they made those decisions. And, you know, obviously they were doing a ton of body core temperature stuff around that. And, and, um, you know, which was the other thing that Wiggins really had going against his hour record that, you know, his, his, uh, air pressure and density, um, on his day were so terrible that, you know, th they raised the, the temperature in the velodrome to like 80 Fahrenheit, um, 
uh, you know, just to, to, to try to give him slightly more favorable atmospherics. But then, of course, yeah. that really starts working against your the thermoregulation right. stuff. Um, yep. yep. Okay. Should we bring it back oh, to what Earth? What a great question. <laughs> okay. We need <laughs> more of those. That's that. So, that is so fun. Needs way more research and more more researchers. <laughs> It's so scientists. different. So many ways uh, to think about it. Yeah, I'm going to start yeah. calling these questions uh, "smart people on weed." <laughs> <laughs> Guys, Could imagine, be. just imagine, if you would, <laughs> you're on the moon and you have uh, a bike, <laughs> dude. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get to one of the questions uh, our listeners sent in through our marginal gains hotline at three one seven three four three four five zero six. Oliver in Switzerland has this question. Hi everyone, I'm Oliver from Switzerland. Thank you very much for the wonderful podcast. You're absolutely amazing. Um, I have a, a mountain bike related question for Josh. I see that most of the World Cup um, cross country bikes have a very wide and broad down tube, which seems to be kind of an aero heresy to me. And I was wondering. <laughs> Uh, if there's, if it's just ignorance uh, on the part of the uh, bike makers, which I I can't believe, or if it's just because the, the air is so dirty um, after the tire that it doesn't matter anymore. I'm riding myself a Ricci Ultra with very thin uh, steel tubes, and I would think that the lower surface uh, of the tube I mean, the narrower surface of the tube makes it a rather more aero bike, or is it so that the round tubes kind of kill this effect? Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion on that and why they don't race on aero cross country bikes. You know, I, I, I don't think that aero and mountain biking has been as much of a thing, but it, to me, it seems like the flex direction. It has got to be the answer, right, Josh? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that wide tube means it is not going to flex as much horizontally as it does vertically, and that's important on a mountain bike. Um, but carbon fiber layups have become so sophisticated, I don't know if that is still strictly true or if you could make an aero mountain bike that still is very, you know, horizontally stiff. Yeah, yeah I, I think the... The simplest answer to the question is, is really that I don't think anybody's thinking about it or cares at hmm. this point. Um, you know, Trek had downhillers in the wind tunnel 10 years ago. Um, you know, I've <laughs> actually haven't had uh, mountain bikes in the wind tunnel, but we've had BMX bikes in the wind tunnel. And, and, you know, those are tiny little bikes, but even with their big tires, that arrow can be a, a, a make a big difference. Um, I, I think a lot of it is you know, mountain bikes are, are being designed to look like mountain bikes. And at the moment, mountain bikes look like they do, <laughs> right? Which, I mean, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but um, I think there's been so much success in this, you know, laterally stiff, but vertically compliant. And if I make this tube really wide, but, you know, really, you know, thin uh, vertically that, that really feels like it makes a lot of sense. You know, that really resonates in people's minds. Like, oh yeah, laterally stiff, vertically compliant. I mean, and, and you know, certainly the the math would bear out that that those two go together. Um, but you know, I, as we talked before, I I am not a huge believer that stiffness is doing anything anyway. So, how stiff do those bikes really need to be? Um, mm -hmm. Probably not as stiff as a lot of them are. Um, you know, <laughs> I think. The uh, Oliver's, you know, traditional steel tube Richie is probably, you know, less than half the stiffness of some of these modern super oversized carbon cross country bikes. But, I mean, he's probably not going any slower on it because, you know, like we've said before, in all the uh, all the equations of motion, you know, <laughs> you can predict rider speed to power on a certain surface with insane accuracy and there's no stiffness term in, in those equations. So, um, you know, I think we've all convinced ourselves a lot about so-called, uh, you know, power losses uh, due to flex and all those things. And they're, you know, if, if they exist, they're extremely, extremely small. Um, 
you know, I I will say I do see it. I recently saw a Scott cross country bike that had some clear, um, it, at least beginnings of some arrow thinking um, in the down tube, and you know my. Uh, again, having just walked into this question with a clean sheet of paper, I, my thought would be, you know, I would pick a down tube shape that's roughly the width of the front tire. Um, and then I would do something like a, you know, probably like a 1 to 1.2, 1 1.25 um, cam tail sort of a section. You know, you can still get great vertical to lateral um uh, stiffness ratios with a, a tube like that. But, you know, one of the, the benefits of a, a, having an airfoil trailing something dirty like, like that front tire is you can actually, um, you know, kind of drafting the, ti- the dirty tire weight, you can actually lower the drag. Um, mm. You know, it, it, it's like, you know, bump drafting and, or drafting in NASCAR, right? <laughs> the, the cars behind are actually making the car in front go faster because they're reducing its, uh, the, the pressure suction drag off the back of that. And, and so you, you could use that to reduce that suction drag in the same way you could use a similar shape tube to reduce um, the drag on the front half of the rear tire. So I, I have no doubt you could um, – yeah, it takes some pretty good drag out of there. And then, I, you know, seat post, you could really do some good stuff there too. A little, little cam tail, well, it could fork. still be one-to-one. You'd still have similar flex profiling, give or take, to round. Or maybe not quite, but it, it wouldn't be too much worse. Um, and you could probably fix some of that in layup. So mm-hmm. my my truest guess there is that nobody's doing it because nobody's doing it. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. And that the first person to do it is going to be looked at as like, what, what the, hell the hell are you doing? Yeah. Like, what are you thinking? Everybody knows it doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, we, we were there 25, 30 years ago with aero and road bikes, you know, like, well, why are you doing that? Everybody knows, you know, it doesn't work. If, <laughs> right. if it worked, the pros would be right. doing it, you know, and and, and we, we see how that world has changed. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there's, there is no technical reason, um, no technically plausible reason why – you know, this wouldn't work here unless you're mountain biking on the moon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, in, in which case, you know, we, we just showed, you know, we just proved that, that on the moon it wouldn't, that I think the current crop of mountain bikes would be perfect. They'd yeah. be just fine. So, I, I mean, <laughs> you change the fork, you change the down tube, you change the handlebars probably a little bit, right? I mean, there's three pretty obvious ways mm. that change, yeah. change yeah. Uh, your your footprint to the wind. It's It seems without doing you wouldn't have to do a whole lot else yeah you really wouldn't and i mean even something as simple as you know you, you think of like the, the the current fork you know they're they're, they're big i mean they're very frontal area heavy mm-hmm. even if you just tweak the casting to slightly ovalize the stanchion you know in the fore aft direction yeah um you could reduce the cda pretty significantly because you know an, an even a, a slight oval is a significant CD reduction over a, a, a circle, um, you know. So cross sectionally, I mean, even if you could get a, you know, f- you know, call it, I don't know, five to ten percent of additional um, cord length front and back, um, call it ten percent, you you probably reduce the CD by, I don't know, twenty percent. I'm sure there, there's charts out there that you can run to do this stuff, but um, hmm. you know, so. so Really subtle changes like that can make a, a big difference coming from round. You know, that's – and I think that's why Arrow was so big when it finally did hit was that, you know, even even the the bad Arrow bikes that we had in like the, the you know, the 90s and the early 2000s, even, even the bad ones were way faster than round. Um, you know, and of course now we're yeah. in a world where it's – you know, it, it's that asymptotic kind of relationship to, you know, the, the life cycle of a technology. I mean, now we're scrapping and scraping for, you know, grams of drag. Um, but on the mountain bike side of things, you know, my God, we're, you know. Yeah, the, the low-hanging the, fruit is just low the, and yeah, hanging Yeah, the, the pickings are right, easy yeah. here, yeah, because the fruit is very low. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we talked about this in the episode we had with uh, Jeremiah Bishop, uh, the RS1 fork, right? That that. And we yep. have a question in our queue about actually the uh, Canada Lefty Ocho, which is, you know, you've only got one stanchion there. So <laughs> that's going to yep. be a little more arrow just because there's less uh, 
less that is punching into the wind. But yeah, it, it, I'm sure that we are going to see that. Uh, I mean, it can't be that far off, right? Someone's going to start going, you know, maybe there's half a minute here in, you know, over, <laughs> over yeah. a four hour race. What if we, what if we go get that half minute? Hey, you know someone we've had on our Leadville show we ought to get on this show is uh, Mm -hmm. EF Pro Cycling's team doctor, Kevin Sprouse. He's a nutritional marginal gainer, if there's ever been one. Yeah, he is. And he's one of the minds behind the Feed Formulas, which is one of the really great products. Our sponsor, the Feed Cells. The Feed Formulas follows the same protocols top athletes use. And they're available to our audience at a 50% discount for your first order. Yeah, you get this by going to thefeed.com forward slash MG, selecting the formula that addresses what you need, and then enter MG for the discount code at checkout. Yeah, these are not generics either. They are best in class. They're branded supplements. They are coming in a nice, convenient daily pouch, which is great for when you are on the road for a race, and so you don't have to go and get out a little pill box and you know sort things into little plastic bags. I like and I use the Athlete Daily Formula, which gives you a great nutritional foundation. And that is actually, I would say, a really good nutritional marginal gain. Get your 50% discount on your first order by going to thefeed.com forward slash MG and entering MG15 at checkout. Batty, it's MG15, right? I believe you're right. Yeah. Okay. Do we got to do the whole thing? Did I get yeah, earlier. I'll I'll fix that. Don't worry. Okay. YouTubers, it's MG15 at discount at <laughs> checkout. Sorry. <laughs> Let me just write that down. Sorry, let's make sure that. Good uh, catch. Thanks, Audi. Yeah, I thought so. I should have ad libbed it when I first saw it. I was like, well. MG15. Okay, I got that. Okay. All right. All right. Let's keep with the arrow theme. For our our next question, we have a good one that came into the comment section of marginalgainspodcast.cc. Listener Charles Buckley has this question about what he calls cycling adjacent sport for you, Josh. Uh, That would concern Elliot Kopchegi, and he recently broke his own marathon world record while wearing a relatively loose top that visibly flapped in the breeze. He says he understands that the power to overcome drag changes dramatically with speeds even at 13 miles per hour. And, of course, he maintained uh, just over two hours, two hours, one minute, nine seconds, actually, for Kipchegi. It would seem to me that minimizing drag, even at those speeds, would be worth something. Did Kipchegi leave time on the table, or has Charles here just been uh, listening to too many podcasts about (laughs) long socks and special textured base layers? Thanks, yes, Josh. This is something you and I have ranted on before. Runners and their loose jerseys. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the short answer is, is a short one. It matters. Um, yeah. even at 13 miles an hour, you know, clearly it, it's not as much as it matters if on a bicycle at 30 miles an hour, but, um, yeah, he's doing himself a disservice. No. I don't know personally if that's like a comfort thing. Um, you know, he's, I don't want to call him older that feels really unfair um but you know he, he's one of the more mature runners out there he's been doing this a long long time i'm sure like a lot of athletes he's he's doing what works because it's always worked before um you know maybe he's just not fit i mean i know certainly on like the sprinter um uh the track and field uh, olympic athlete side of things you know when when they started to push for more aerodynamic and tighter clothing and all that thing. I mean, there, there was a lot of pushback from a lot of, particularly the male athletes, mm-hmm. um, you know, not wanting to wear that stuff uh, and, until they saw, you know, again, it takes getting beat by somebody wearing it to, <laughs> to change that game. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think this is absolutely, um, you know, him, him doing something because that's how he does it. And, you know, he's winning and, you know, he he would be winning by more potentially if he if he did make the change. But you know, if you look, I mean, when he broke the two hour marathon record, he wore a loose fitting floppy top. Um, but but then he also uh, they ran with a sort of like you know uh, uh, V you know the echelon V formation around him um, for aerodynamic reasons because they knew that that mattered. I mean, that was very carefully uh, scripted. You know, even to the point of 
um, you know, how they would sort of reorient the V based on wind direction and how they cycled, uh, you know, they sort of pace lined, uh, you know, the runners to so they could take turns, you know, <laughs> being up front. And, uh, it, you know, absolutely it matters. We know that it matters. Um, Kipchoge himself has been involved in these, these uh, you know, other attempts where he knows that it matters. But I think this is one of those where he's doing what he's comfortable with and he's still winning. So <laughs> right, he, he's probably not changing yeah. anytime soon. Right. The only thing I might say in his defense here, Charles, is thermoregulation. We talked about this earlier. So maybe he's trying to create a little wind movement between, you know, his top mm -hmm. and his skin. And again, trying to keep his core body temperature down enough. So again, power output, right? You start your body temperature starts going up, power output starts going down. So maybe that... And, Josh, looking actually at photos from that sub-2, that demonstration marathon that they did, and his official record-breaking one in Berlin, it looks like his clothing has tightened up a little bit. Now, he wore a number for the Berlin marathon, and it is mm. – I'll give him a, a B- minus for how it's <laughs> attached to the jersey, <laughs> as far as that's concerned. Um, but and, and thirdly, what, what needs to be said here, too, is he now has a contract with Ineos. So he is getting great advice at this point. The same advice that mm -hmm. was being given to Filippo Ghana and to Dan Bigham and all the resources that those folks have. Now Elliot has, has some of that same stuff. So maybe we need to just trust the guy as he's, he's getting closer and closer to an official sub two marathon. It's, it's a low hanging fruit thing again, though, right? Yeah. It, at some point, someone's going to beat that and they're going to do it using every possible advantage and you start doing the smaller and smaller things it's the little marginal gains that are eventually going to have to come into play so maybe not yet but probably not before too long so i want to bring in a follow-up comment uh this is related to a conversation about nitrogen in tubes uh, i think this was from uh episode 26 of our aja series this voicemail, again, number on that is 317-343-4506, comes from a retired aerospace engineer whose wife is getting into triathlons, which I believe makes him our actual marginal gains listener archetype. <laughs> hey, Josh, love your show. Uh, my wife started doing triathlons, and I'm a retired aerospace engineer. So I love all this stuff. Uh, the and tire pressure and air... Don't forget about water vapor. It's a big, big deal. The pressure changes radically with temperature. Uh, and if you keep putting air in your tire, the water stays just like an air compressor. You got to vent your air compressor, as you know. So uh, that's why nitrogen's cool, because it doesn't have any water in it. I, I cannot agree more. I don't... <laughs> I have, I have nothing to add. Um, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that that's why the the nitrogen and and uh, you know my preferred argon. Um, it's one of the things that that makes them so great. Now, you know, I will say, um, you know, it, we going tubeless. We're now adding sealant, and there's water and sealant, and um, hmm. so you know, using a dry gas and sealant may potentially make the sealant dry out a little quicker. Uh, you know, because there's no humidity in it, things like that. But yeah, no, he's a hundred percent spot on, and that—that's why you know, certainly, uh, you know, for your car, you should absolutely be running uh, nitrogen or or argon. Mm -hmm. In fact, we got more in this conversation, and it concerns argon for you, Josh. Uh, another MG Hotline question: three one seven three four three four five zero six. This one comes in from the UK, and um, did we get a name here, Fatty? I don't think. This has a nope. name. No nope, name. An on this anonymous one. person. Okay, that's all right. We still take those. <laughs> um, this this texter, this messenger, uh, mentioned a video too that goes along with uh, what happens with argon. He called it the Applied Science video on YouTube. You can it's find a, it by. It, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, the Applied Science. It's actually a whole channel, a whole bunch of really good, smart hmm. videos on Applied Science. Okay, and it's the hexafluoride cool. tennis balls video i guess on that channel in particular the video discusses a uh, sodium hexafluoride versus air versus argon properties for high speed compression along with losses and hysteresis and uh, the video summarizes in terms of shock absorption specifically gas gamma is discussed as the relevant property argon he says is hard to beat maybe krypton or helium would work slightly better 
than argon. Mm. It, that would make sense. Yeah, I, I have not seen this video, and I am not a chemist, So, but I, I – 100%. And I will say that the challenge with helium is that it escapes the tire really fast. I have mm. not tried Krypton. Um, but no, I will I will watch this. And I think if there's um, – yeah, I mean, he said like in his note here, the energy stored in the chemical bonds of multi-atom gases. I mean, that that is so cool. Mm. It's it's hard to get your head around how that that is, is, is in the interplay here. But I um, – yeah, but I'll you watch will the video. Want we'll to... Comment in the in the next episode. That's that is really cool. So it, it, thank you. It's a good video. I watched it. There are more than six hundred and fifty thousand views of that video and thirteen hundred comments. Holy smokes! People are interested in this crazy <laughs> stuff. Yeah, it's a great video. You know, he's testing the uh, the oxygen versus argon content in tennis balls throughout the years. It uh, you're going to love this. You are going to love this, Josh. It, this, oh, I, I think so cool. I, we have found your new obsession. I love what our listeners <laughs> point us toward. Okay. Oh, that's fabulous. We got time right. for one more here, I guess. And again, another one on uh, coming in via text. And by the way, folks, our text line is the same as the, our voicemail line. So you can either just text it or leave a voicemail 317 343 4506. Again, text this time, Peter Thorsness. From Laramie, Wyoming, asks, "What does Josh think about tire inserts for endurance mountain bike racing races? That is like, oh, what do you what do you know? The Leadville Trail One Hundred? <laughs> what do you know? Uh, he's thinking in terms of racing on a very light wheel set, sub twelve hundred grams, and supple light tires, um, six hundred grams or so for a twenty nine er. So yeah, total of twelve hundred grams there, and then." Ensuring against damage using a good tire insert. In fact, this is something Fatty and I talked about in the Leadville podcast, mm -hmm. about whether or not to run mm -hmm. a tire insert. He says, I've used the PTNR Evolution Puncture Protection Inserts and feel like they worked as advertised and have uh, limped a couple of them home back after a flat due to an unpluggable hole with the insert keeping everything together. Yeah, that's kind of the point of an insert. The question boils down to the effects of roll on rolling resistance and the added weight, which is about 70 grams per wheel, and how big a deal an insert would be to performance. Yeah. Before you get to mm. this answer, Josh, I, I kind of actually want to call something out crazy here. So before this podcast, you know, not just this episode, but this whole podcast that we are 80 something episodes into before the Leadville podcast, Hottie and I've done hundreds of episodes on before the pace line uh, the Hottie and I were in before cycling tips podcast before fatcyclist.com. I actually had a website <laughs> called Epic Rides, and it was just a site where people could submit stories about their big rides. Uh, 25 or 27 years ago when I had this, I published a story about the inaugural Laramie Range Enduro, which was written by Peter Thorsness. <laughs> so it's been more than a <laughs> quarter cool. century since uh, I have heard from Peter. <laughs> I am absolutely certain this has got to be the same guy. Good to hear from you again a quarter of a century later, Peter. I, I recognized the name and the plays, put them together. I was like, I got to search this. And yep, yep, same guy, definitely same guy. Anyway, oh, I think so a lot fun. of folks that's are so going fun. to be interested. Uh, <laughs> yes, this is <laughs> this podcast, old friends meeting. It's awesome. But I, I'm interested. I'm Peter is obviously interested in your thoughts on inserts. Yep. So I, I, I do not know. Uh, I'm not familiar with the, in, the particular insert he mentions, but I'll – I'll, I'll just talk on my experience here generally. Um, the the sort of like bead locking narrower inserts, particularly the ones like the technology that Vittoria is using that we we use with quite a few of our pro teams. Um, the the kind of ones that like sh they kind of compress and shrink uh, when exposed to the air pressure in the tire, and then when the tire goes flat, they sort of grow back to fill the void. Um, those have proven to have very little effect on rolling resistance, um, and yet they still both uh, have proven to be quite protective against pinch flatting and quite uh, effective, you know, even after a flat. I think I said in one of the previous episodes, you know, we had two riders at, at Perry Bay last year who finished on flats that they didn't even quite, you know, they they just thought were like low 
maybe they were losing a little bit of pressure or whatever. They, they didn't even realize they were like flat, flat. Um, so that technology is getting quite good, but it, it needs to be that, um, that kind of smaller, tighter fitting liner that fits down in between the tire beads and then maybe sticks up more, you know, square or, um, you know, maybe kind of a little bit rounder, but up into the, into the tire itself, the more like impact protecting, um, tire liners out there. Like, uh, the only name I can ever remember is the Huck Norris because <laughs> it's, because <laughs> it's just such an awesome name. Um, yeah. but you know, where it's like a wide rectangle and it sits up in the middle of the tire, um, to protect from, uh, pinch flats under like extreme impact. Those have been shown to have actually some pretty significant rolling resistance um, uh, penalties in in a lot of instances. And so I would say something like that uh, I would call not worth it, um, whereas something like, uh, you know, that the, the Vittoria product, uh, I, I would say well worth it. And, you know, I think the, the you know, it, it's a beautiful time we're in where, you know, you've got some of these um, – you know, the, the light, these ultra light, ultra low rolling resistance tires also work really, really well with tubeless sealants. Um, from the experience we've had, a lot of them, you know, we're running them at low enough pressures that, you know, depending on what you hit, you know, you're oftentimes minimizing the size of the puncture, um, you know, due to the pressure being low, right? When the, when the pressure's high and the casing tension is high, uh, you're more likely to cut the fibers adjacent to a mm. puncture uh, or have them tear. And, uh, and so that's a thing that, you know, that's one of the reasons road tubeless is so hard is that, you know, you, you, you hit something, a piece of glass and you put a three millimeter puncture in before it, it, as that's puncturing and before it can lose air, if you nick the adjacent casing fibers, they can tear because they're under, they're now taking the load of, right. of where the hole now is. Um, and so, you know, all those things have come together. And of course, wheel weights are just going crazy low. I mean, you know, what do you say? Tw like 1200 grams for a 29 er wheel set or something. I mean, it's, uh, uh, yeah. Putting, putting another 50 or 70 grams per wheel in, in one of these liners is, I feel like cheap insurance. Um, and as long as it's the right insert, it's going to cost you very little mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, of rolling resistance. What Fatty and I found on our other show, we did a kind of a poll on tire use, and, and we also asked people whether or not they'd run inserts, and very few people said they would run them. Um, and we also checked in with some of the pros on this who were doing the Leadville Trail 100. Now, Keegan Swenson ran an insert in the rear only. Now Keegan could put sand in his tires and BU, so like <laughs> he ran inserts right, front right. he ran inserts front and rear at Unbound and the heaviest duty casing that Maxis has to offer in a gravel tire. Mm. Only because, you know, wow. failing at those races when you're in the lifetime Grand Prix is is bad. That means you're you're right. screwed if you're going for a lot of prize money. So he he chose insurance over absolute speed. We all, I also talked to a guy like Payson McKelvin about the same topic and he said yeah normally i do run inserts but not for leadville because i want the speed i want the gains i'm going to get without mm -hmm. the insert and i know with the, with the insert they mm -hmm. most of them not all of them as josh pointed out are going to cost me a little bit when it comes to rolling resistance yep yep yeah and i will say melissa uh, my daughter who did use inserts in big sugar which we had just a couple of weeks ago right mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there wasn't a ton of climbing and there wasn't a lot of hard braking a lot of fast turns where once you get up to speed, a little bit of extra uh, uh, out, you know, weight on the outside of your wheel is not such a bad thing. Well, guys, yeah, we have barely makes, made makes a dent in our questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I would say, too, I'm a little su surprised at, at the response from, you know, the lead focus. To me, I, part of, I think, the um, uh, Lifetime Grand Prix, part of what makes that so interesting is, you know, the, the racers having to think of that as like a system. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think, like, you know, we, we said like, you know, if, if you just have a time trial, you're trying to set a, a, a record for, you know, no matter what the event is, you know, and a, a, a puncture or a low tire or almost any mechanical is going to keep you from winning. will go for the whole thing. You know, when you put that into a series or into a stage race, you know, like the tour de France, um, you know, is, 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 potentially staying with the front group worth, you know, four Watts. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right. If, if it's going to, if it's potentially earning you points over a, you know, a, a 
six series race mm-hmm. or a 20 day stage mm-hmm. racer. So yeah, that, that might be one I'd, I'd be interested to talk to those guys and just kind of game that, you know, almost like game theory that out a little bit of like, Oh, how let's, let's look at how we might want to put that. Cause I think you, you could pretty quickly, yeah, find yourself in a spot where you're like, Oh, well, there's the downsides actually quickly approach zero when you think of it over the course of the, the event. Um, but then at the same time, like you said, I, I think Keegan could race on two flat tires and still beat the rest of us. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. All right, guys, we've barely made a dent in the questions. And here's a little dirty little secret about how I selected them. <laughs> so I tend to start at the top, uh, at the most recent. So if you've got a question for Josh, maybe wait a couple days after this episode comes out then send it. That puts it at the top of the pile. Uh, and here's, oops, and then it's you, Hottie. Sorry about oh, that. then it's me. Mm. And here's how you get your question at the top of the pile. You become a host of the show, like me, and I'll just go straight <laughs> to the front. That's how it works, usually. No, really. Uh, text it's or call. true. That it is, is the, true. so true. We both got one in this one. <laughs> uh, text or call the Marginal Gains hotline, 317-343-4506. Again, 317-343-4506. You can also comment on this or any episode at marginaldegainspodcast.cc, which is where you'll see links to all the platforms for listening to this show. Oh, sorry, that's me. (laughs) And and we'll we'll be back soon with more questions you desperately need answers to, uh, if only you'd thought to ask them, right here on Marginal Gains. All right. Okay, guys. Sorry, I started no, I started reading the, the bonus question, and you're... then I got lost. <laughs> like, oh, oh, shit, that's me. It's my, it's my turn to talk. And here <laughs> is that bonus question. This is one for our very patient, <sighs> long-suffering friends who are watching this very uh, unedited raw recording on YouTube. I think both of you actually are going to have good answers for this very practical question, which is a text come from an unnamed person with an Oakland area code. He says... Or she says, I'm not sure. How do I know when it's time to swap out the wax in my hot pot? I primarily mountain bike so the wax gets a fair amount of dirt in it, even though I brush it off and then wipe it with an alcohol rag. And I've I've forgotten to turn off the pot for a few days once or twice. (laughs) (laughs) They continue, I've had the current batch going for about six months, waxing a chain every week or two. What should I look to for to know when it is time to dump it out and refresh that wax? <laughs> oh my! Um, on the leaving it on or the overheating, because we we get that question a lot. Um, if it gets if if it's truly overheated um, and and damaged, it will turn yellow. And we we've actually tested that by just like seeing how high we can heat it and what happens. And and it will when it dries, it'll take on like a weird yellowy kind of a color to the wax. And you know the, the tungsten sulfide sort of settles at the bottom so you can you, you can see the color of the wax um after it cools. So if it's beginning to yellow, you know, that's you probably you probably pushed it a little bit too far. Um or too far for too long. because uh, it, it is pretty resilient. Uh, certainly in our testing, man, with the, the tungsten disulfide being a dark, uh, you know, essentially a, a, a black, um, it's actually a really super dark gray at color additive. It is so hard to tell, uh, when the wax is actually dirty versus just what it's supposed to be. So, you know, my recommendation there would be that, um, you know, instead of wiping it down or, or if you, if you can, um, Instead of wiping it down, throw it in a pot of boiling water um, and agitate it for a few minutes before you wax it. Uh, it it's pretty amazing. It, it, it's actually kind of fun. You, you throw it in boiling water, shake it a little bit, and then like five seconds later, it's just like, boom, all this wax floats up to the mm-hmm. top <laughs> that comes out. I mean, it, it really is kind of yeah. cool. Um, I would recommend that, and you you will dramatically reduce, I mean, by, you know, 90 something percent the amount of dirt um and contaminated or or, or whatever otherwise damaged wax um that could be contaminating your your clean wax and you know it it just takes another two or three minutes um in the process so i would certainly recommend that i i also have some people who um 
use like the little pour over style, um, uh, like not coffee pot, but what am I trying to say? Uh, kettle. Kettle. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, it, and, and, you know, before they even take it off the bike, just sort of pedal forward and pour it over the, uh, the chain ring in the front half of the chain at the front half of the, the chain ring there and let it just drip off onto the floor, um, you know, or onto a piece of cardboard or something. And, and that can work, can work quite well. Um, also just, you know, be careful. You don't want to be pouring boiling water over your, uh, you know, bearing surfaces and seals and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, yeah, not, Hattie, what, you know, what I'm, reli- well, your- I'm religious about, um, you know, microfiber towel and spray bottle with some alcohol in it. After every dirt, dirt, dusty ride, you know, I wipe things down right away to try and track and draw some of that dust and dirt away. And so I'll wipe the chain down and my cog sets and my, any, you know, anything that has teeth on it. So I, I wipe all that stuff down, and that way when I do go ahead and pull the chain off, I'm less likely to introduce residual dirt to to the pot itself. And like Josh said, the boiling water thing is, on all, any bike I ride in the dirt, um, I do the boiling water thing every time I rewax because it just takes, hmm. I'm probably going to wash the bike anyhow, so some hot water is good, good to have around to help you wash your bike, so... Going ahead to slosh it in the in the hot water real quick, mm. let it dry out, and then and then into the hot wax is is a great routine. Is it a little extra step? Yeah, it is, but you know, off road riding generally introduces that anyhow. I mean, you know, that's what you're going to have to deal with. So that's Josh. I have heard of some people. I think having some type of lowering basket where they can low they put their chain on a basket and then lower it into the the hot wax and and the basket oh, yeah. will not yeah, I have not those. sit quiet at the bottom of the wax and then that way the dirt. <laughs> at least settles to the bottom and the chain is suspended above the dirt. That's another yeah, here, trick I've here's seen mine. people do. <laughs> um, here's mine, and it, yeah. it does make the waxing easier, but you you need to agitate the, the molten wax right. to get the tungsten disulfide up, and it's going to take the dirt with it. So that the, the basket um, works really well uh, for dirt to fall through to the bottom, provided it, it's reasonably heavy, uh, in your ultrasonic cleaner. Um, but really by the time you get the, your, your wax agitated for, mm-hmm. uh, for your chain waxing, that the dirt's swirling around yeah. with the, with the friction additives. So, um, I would say that's probably not as effective. I, I will say though, this is a, um, is a great reason, a great justification for an instant pot, uh, because the instant pot, you can buy additional, uh, the stainless steel liner. Mm-hmm that goes mm-hmm. in the pot. And so like, you know, on my workbench, I have one instant pot with two liners and I'll, you know, I'll come in to get started. I'll uh, have the wax in there, or, you know, I'll hit cook, um, get the chain off the bike, kind of start, you know, doing the stuff that, you know, get the bike in the stand, get the chain off, do that. Um, you know, it's about seven minutes typically for the wax to fully melt. Um, and then I'll put the water in, you know, throw the chain in the water, um, hit rice. <laughs> Cause the rice is like, full tilt in an instant pot. Um, and it's only like two minutes at that point, uh, to boil the water with the chain uh-huh. in it and all the stuff floats to the top. You pour the, the water off with all the dirty wax. Um, and then I just toss the chain, uh, right into the wax, put it back in the pot and let it cook. And you'll actually see like some of the, the water will boil out through the top oh, of the wax, it? which is okay. fine. It doesn't hurt anything. Yeah. It, it doesn't hurt anything. Um, and then when it stops bubbling, it's, it's done. Mm-hmm. You know, all the water's been been driven out. You shake it, agitate it a bunch of times, and then pull it back out again. Oh, great! Um, you saved me a step. So that's or, sort of my routine, yeah, and I because I always dry yeah, the chain yeah, out yeah, after going in the hot water. I won't do that anymore. I'll just throw it straight in. Okay. Yeah, I I like I shake it. Sure. I mean, you know, you don't want to put a ton right. of water in there, but um, yeah, we we actually we're kind of looking at and have done some testing on that. You know, just on the. Uh, the little friction rig of like, you know, uh, we know the water and the wax don't, you know, they don't mix. If you boil the water out, it, it theoretically shouldn't be doing anything. Um, the the one thing I, I will add there, though, is, um, you know, I would recommend using um, like like a filtered water. Or, you know, we here in our studio, we actually have a, a RO water filter um, for making coffee and for, for the staff to drink. Uh, and so I do always make sure to rinse the, the chain in um, RO water because, like, our, our water here in India is super hard. Mm. Um, and so it's interesting, like, if you if you uh, boil a chain and you don't wax it right away and it sits, it will water spot <laughs> really uh. hard. 
Um, and and when you look at you know what what's a water spot, it's calcium and all this other you know shit yeah. that you know you don't want that stuff in there. Um, and so I would say that's the, just one other thing to keep in mind is you know you also don't want to be introducing um, you know these hard crusty minerals. Um, you know, to to your program, so make sure you're using some sort of filtered okay. water. I feel bad leaving this uh, out of the regular podcast. How do you how to just you know make it a little <laughs> Easter egg after the theme music at the end? This is good stuff. This isn't something that we should just uh, that it should be just left uh, on the cutting room floor. I'll let I thought you we were getting complaints decision. due to all the chain spa talk. No, not yet. Shut up, Hottie, and his chain spot talk. That is. I don't think here. anyone said oh, okay. that. I think that you're speaking to our listeners. I don't know if it, it's sort of a oh. self fulfilling. Oh my God! Now, but... see, now I, I have to call Jens and get him to say "shut up, yeah. Hottie." Oh, I'd love that. I'd put it on my phone. That would be your ringtone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> could, yeah, it could be your ringtone. Shut up, Hottie. Oh. All right. That would be. That is awesome. Okay. 